child if it was happening at the moment. All the pleasures involved in that. And it was just extraordinary. <laughs> she forgot the pain. She just remembered the pleasure. And when he mapped together the regions involved in these experiential responses, they all mapped out to the temporal lobe and to a region deep to the temporal lobe, which also gave very powerful experiential response, called the hippocampus. This is a region that lies just below the medial temporal lobe. I was a medical student at the time he was doing this, and you cannot imagine the excitement he produced in the medical community. Larry Kuby, a teacher at Columbia, a very gifted psychoanalyst, also a good neurologist, ran up to Montreal, tape record in hand, because he was sure Penfield had discovered Freud's unconscious mental processes. People were recalling memories they hadn't thought about for years. A number of neuroscientists were skeptical. They thought that maybe he was eliciting some sort of an aura related with seizure activity in these patients. But the whole view of medial temporal lobe and hippocampus changed with the famous patient H.M. that some of you may have heard about. H.M. <clears throat> was nine years old when he was knocked over by somebody riding a bicycle. That gave him a bilateral concussion on the temporal lobes, which gave him scars on both temporal lobes. He developed epilepsy, and that epilepsy was well controlled for many years. So he was able to finish elementary school, he was able to go to high school, he was able to start work in an assembly plant. But by the time he was about 22 or 23, the seizures could no longer be controlled with medicine. So he was living in New Haven. He went to a surgeon by the name of Scoville, uh, William Scoville, who had, was very much influenced by Penfield. And Scoville operated on him and removed the scar tissue from the temporal lobe. And he felt he had to go deeper to that, to the hippocampus, because some of the scar ex extended to that. This is the first time that both sides of the temporal lobes were significantly removed in an operation. Penfield only removed one side because he had only dealt with scars on one side. As a result of that removal of the medial temporal lobe and the hippocampus, uh, HM has been without seizures. A friend of mine saw him a year and a half ago. He very rarely has a mild seizure, beautifully controlled with medication. But he was left with the most devastating memory loss, similar to Clive Waring as a result of this procedure. Scoville was besides himself. He was extremely upset. He called up Penfield and told him about this tragedy. And Penfield understood and he said, you know, we knew the temporal lobe was important for memory. I had never had experience with bilateral removal. What we should do is to have Brenda Milner come and study this patient. Brenda Milner is a very gifted psychologist. She'd studied all the patients that I, Penfield, have worked on. And she's extremely familiar with memory and medial temporal lobe. So Brenda Milner came down, and she, of course, confirmed that HM had a tremendous memory deficit. But she was able to also detect that there were aspects of memory storage that were perfectly intact. To begin with, HM had perfectly good memory for things that occurred prior to the surgery. So he remembered, as you and I do, the childhood traumata of our lives. He remembered going to elementary school. He remembered going to high school. His intellectual function was the same. His IQ was unaltered. He remembered everything that happened prior to the operation, which indicated to Brenda Milner that long-term memory, long, long periods of time, are stored in other parts of the brain. We think these are stored in the cerebral cortical areas that process the information as it comes in, number one. Number two, she found, they had a perfectly good short-term memory. So if you transiently introduced him to Tom Jessel, he could focus on Tom Jessel and remember Tom Jessel's name as long as he repeated it. So that indicated that short-term memory is stored elsewhere. And we have reason to believe that this kind of short-term memory is stored in the prefrontal cortex. What HM lacked, and lacked in the most profound sense, is that he could not take new short-term memory and put into new long-term memory. So for example, he saw Brenda Milner repeatedly over this 30-year period. 
Every time she walked into the room, it was as if he had seen her for the first time. He would sit down and read a newspaper. He'd read the first paragraph of an article. He would forget it. He would start all over again. He would eat a meal. When he was finished, he'd forgotten he ate it. He would start all over again. He looked at a picture of himself 10 years after the operation. He couldn't recognize himself. He had enormous difficulty in converting any short-term memory to long-term memory. This was extremely important because Med Brenda Milner had discovered a specific location. She showed that the hippocampus and the medial temporal lobe are absolutely essential for converting short-term to long-term memory. For many years, a period of over 10 years, Brenda Milner thought that this applied to all areas of knowledge, that everything that HM learned in short-term memory, he could not convert into long-term memory. And then she made another fantastic discovery. She gave a terrific lecture at the Society of Neuroscience meeting two weeks ago in which she said this was the most exciting moment of a scientific career. She found that, in fact, there were certain areas of knowledge in which HM could convert short-term to long-term memory. And that is, he could learn certain motor tasks. And some of you have performed these tasks she had him do a mirror drawing task. And that's a situation in which you have to draw the outlines of a star by looking neither at the star or your hand or the pencil, but looking only at the mirror because you cannot see the star or your hand. This is the apparatus. Many of you have used that. Others of, other of you that have not had a chance to do so could do so later on outside. She found that when HM did this, he made a number of mistakes the first day, but improved over 10 trials. The second day started off better and got better still, and the third day, perfect. This is as good as you can do. In fact, this is one of the students in this group. Lots of mistakes at the beginning, <laughs> perfect afterwards, and this is the average data for a whole bunch of students here. An extra, you people are as good as HM. I'm going to tell your parents that you've got a terrific memory. But there's one fantastic difference between you and HM. You remember what you did the previous day, and you remember how you progressed from day to day. So you understand you did better on Wednesday than you did on Monday because you did 10 trials a day each of those three days. But when you asked HM, how come you're doing better on Wednesday than you did on Monday, he would say, what are you talking about? I've never done this before in my life. He was completely unaware that he was doing this. So Brenda Miller discovered what we now know to be a large area of mental life in which memory is stored in an unconscious way. So this made us realize that their memory storage is not a unitary faculty of mind. That there are at least two major kinds of memory processes that are stored at different sites and use different logic. They're called explicit and implicit, respectively. Explicit memory is a memory for facts and events for people, places, and objects. They involve the hippocampus and the medial temporal lobe. You take those out, you lose this, and it requires conscious recall. So if you ask yourself, you know, what was it like on the first date? You make a conscious effort to recall that. If you think about your last birthday, a conscious effort to recall that. You know, how to get back home, this requires a conscious effort to recall that. Everything that is stored in explicit memory that is hippocampal based requires conscious effort to recall. By contrast, we all master a large number of motor and perceptual skills that once they're mastered become completely unconscious. These are stored in a number of structures in the amygdala for emotional memory, in cerebellar for motor memory, and in the simplest reflex pathways which Tom and I are going to consider in later lectures these allow you to store modifications of reflex strength, various motor skills, 
or emotional things. And when you recall these, it's an unconscious effort.